Knocks it through. Mullen bursting into the box. Josh Mullen. Mullen's ball across. It's turned in. It's Pittman who's got it. Livingston leads. Now can they get the ball back in? O'Brien. The lead. And Livingston have the lead. Man, the score. The full time whistle blows and David Hay celebrates. And the Livingston fans join in exultation. Livingston had the lead against Rangers. And they are certainly rising to a few occasions on their return to the top flight in Scotland. Hello and welcome back to Talk Livy, the podcast dedicated to everything Livingston Football Club and Scottish football. My name is Angus and today I'm joined by Ewan. Ewan, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. I'm still uh, I'm still on a wee bit of a high from, from Saturday's uh, performance at Easter Road and result. Obviously, I think if anyone's seen our social media, it was clear to see a few of us were enjoying ourselves on Saturday night as well. It was uh, Derek White, the club secretary's birthday, so we were out for that. And Nicky Devlin, our man, he has a new song get on the bandwagon with that it's an absolute it's an absolute floor filler that one it went down very well but yeah I'm all good mate what about yourself I mean say again I was uh, on quite a high on Saturday as well Um I think it all got frozen out of me at the women's game yesterday but you know we'll go and talk about that uh, a wee bit later on but as always you can find this episode as well as all of our others on your pod uh, your preferred podcast streaming sites just search for Talk Livy so follow us or subscribe to ensure that you don't miss another episode We'll start the episode off by discussing a busy week for the Lions. First up, it was a trip to the Harry Styles Bowl to face Rangers, and then a short trip to Leith for a thriller in the capital against Hibs. The Lionesses finally returned to action at the Tony Macaroni Arena. We'll discuss all the action from their Scottish Cup tie against Montrose. And we'll then discuss our home game against St Johnston before Glenn Schroeder from the Red Tinted Glasses podcast gives us the lowdown on Aberdeen ahead in next weekend's game. Games are coming thick and fast for the Lions. First up this week was the trip to Glasgow as we took on the Champions Rangers. Ewan, it was always going to be a tough task, but not a bad performance despite the 1-0 defeat, was it? Yeah, I think out of the games at Ibrox this season, I think it's the best equipped performance we've had there. I think we offered a little bit more going forward than the previous games. I've obviously touched on the, the cup tie when we previewed it last week. It was quite disappointing. We showed very little in terms of attacking threat, but, you know, I think we set up to to try and play on the counter where possible. And I think there were times that we did cause Rangers problems. I think we probably had the first real chance of the game. Odin Bailey's had an effort just outside the box. Uh, McGregor saved it fairly comfortable. But, you know, Rangers, I, I, tr- I was talking to Andy and, and Wall, who I go to the games with, and was saying, Comparing it to the game at Celtic Park earlier in the season, where Celtic were putting loads of balls into our box, but it was floated crosses and a big front man. And we were dealing with that quite well. We have centre halves so who are you know going to win most things in the air. But Rangers, they kept firing balls low across our six yard box. And there was a good five or six during the game where you know it's inches away from someone just having a tap in or one of our centre halves turning it into their own net. And it was it was one of those games where it was a matter of time. I feel that Rangers were going to get an opportunity and score. And, you know, as I say, first half, we, we did hang in there. And I think Odin Bailey gave us a decent out ball, in particular in terms of carrying the ball. I think Bruce Anderson helped get us up the park as well. Again, we were trying to play at, uh, Bruce in behind where we could. There was a potentially controversial incident. Jack Fitzwaters had a header cleared off the line. There was a few a bit of chat about it, whether it was a penalty or not. Angus, what's your view on it? We obviously joked 
before the game that, you know, after Rangers came out and said, you know, all the stuff about like the referee performance against the game against Aberdeen, that we were never going to get anything. Watching the highlight, watching the, you know, how the cameras caught it, it looks like it's a hand. It looks like a hand to me. Is it conclusive enough? You know, maybe not. But at the same time, this is a decision that if it didn't get given towards Rangers, we'd be seeing it in every website. We'd be seeing it on, you know, it'd have its own feature on Sky Sports. We'd be seeing it, its own feature on BBC Sport. It would be made, you know, such a big deal out of in that. So, you know what, we should feel aggrieved by it because, you know, that's twice we went to Glasgow this season and, you know, we probably should have a penalty. The game against Celtic when Joe Hart just punched the I.O. in the face at a corner. All the way around, you know, these things get made a massive deal out of. Um, we're just supposed to be like, yeah, it's fine. Like, it just happens part and parcel of the game. But, aye, definite, definite penalty for me. <laughs> now, I, I was along the same lines as you at the time. <laughs> uh, I kind of said penalty. The more and more I watch it back, and I, if I'm going to be consistent with myself, so we had a penalty incident uh, that went in our favour at St Mirren early in the season where Paniyatu's headed it onto his hand. And, <laughs> and Lowry, I feel, has it's come off his chest onto his arm, which makes me kind of have to go down, if I'm going to be consistent, say that it's not a penalty because the ruling is if it comes off another part of your body onto your arm. It's, it's not a penalty. However, I totally agree with you. If that's at the other end of the park, that's a Livingston player on the line, I'd love to see the backlash if that decision's not given in Rangers' favour. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's not a penalty, but had it been up the other end, I would not have been surprised had it been given. But I think, you know, that aside, it was, a, it was an opportunity for Fitzy. It's obviously been cleared off the line. Sakala's then had one very close range. Max has pulled off a fantastic point blank save for that. And second half again, we struggled a bit more second half to get out. You know, Rangers, as you expect, if you're nil nil at half time with the old firm, you expect you're going to be really penned in for the second half, especially early doors. And they had chances again. Itton's had a header that's gone wide. Sakala's had an effort, which brilliant save by Max. I thought Sakala was excellent, by the way. Cause no end of problems every time he picked up the ball. I was terrified. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. He was just every time he squared up our centre half or our full backs and was just running at us. He he just looked like he was going to make something happen. But the goal finally came kind of 15 minutes from time. And you have to say it was a real bit of quality from Scott Arfield. It's the only bit of the net he could put that in and and score. And it's a fantastic finisher. Maybe question Omionga for it. If you look at it back, Omionga is with Arfield. I think he goes to try and pass Arfield onto one of the centre halves and doesn't follow the run. I think he's trying to pass him on to one of the centre halves when he's running into the box and nobody ends up picking him up and he's left unmarked in the box, which you can't really do with a player of his quality. But we almost, we almost snatched a point late on. A great ball from Jack McMillan. I hope if he gets any real contact on it, he's probably finding the net. He's on fire just now, a big I.O. in front of goal as well. So you would have fancied him in that position. But look, at the end of the day, I think Rangers did deserve to win the game if you're looking at the chances created. But I think we did go there and give a very good account of ourselves. Obviously, you get the classic. I got it off a few Rangers fans that I know, the anti-football, you know, all this sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, we've come closer to getting a result than a number of teams have at Ibrox this season. Just because we haven't had a goal doesn't mean you, you can't get a result. So, look, I would have taken, sounds daft, I would have taken that prior to the game, going there, giving a good account of ourselves, being competitive, and we were unfortunate to maybe not hang on a little bit longer and, and hopefully, hopefully get a point out of the game. Yeah, I mean, any time that we go to Glasgow to face either of them, it is essentially, you know, that kind of a free hit. All you can ask for is, you know, the team giving as much as they can. And, you know, fair enough to them as well. You know, we've had quite a few quite a few kind of double-header games as well. You know, a big game at the weekend as well that was supposed to be following it. So, you know, the team really gave their all, uh, not really kind of like keeping one eye, you know, on the weekend as well. I mean, there was a couple of changes, but for the most part of the team, it's kind of kept the same. But... 
yeah, I think we can be very spirited about it. And I think that the reaction following the game, you know, was very much that. It wasn't kind of a doom and gloom. We kind of talked to him earlier in the season, you know, after how we played, after we played Celtic and we got that positive result. And it was like, oh, we can really try and kick on from here. When we followed it up with a terrible performance against Hearts and then like a, a loss to Rangers as well or the other way around. And it kind of killed that momentum. Even though we've lost here, it definitely hasn't, you know, kind of had, like dented the confidence of the team. And I mean, I guess we may as well just go straight on to, you know, the Hibs game now. There's not really much more to talk about with Rangers, but you can see that the confidence from, you know, that has been deriving in the uh, last couple of weeks has continued from there in the match against Hibs. Obviously, you know, not too much of the best of starts. You know, we offered them a couple of easy chances. Well, an easy chance for Dodge to get like a free header in the box. You know, he hits the post. And then obviously they get the goal from the corner shortly after with uh, Dimitri Mitchells, you know, the turncoat, former Hearts lover. And, uh, anyway, and speaking of turncoats, Callum Brown is a turncoat these days. Uh, you know, Wait, who's, who's Callum Brown? I don't know. Uh, some commentates or something like that. I don't know. I don't know who he is. He claims he's a commentator. I don't know. Yeah, he what, is. Is, he, is he a part of this? Is he a part of this team? Like, is he a part no of idea. this team? No idea, yeah. mate. Absolutely no idea. Strange name that, but he's irrelevant. Yeah. He's irrelevant. He's he's obviously irrelevant now. I'm only kidding, yeah. Bruni. I don't want you crying when you listen to that. But yes, um, um, yeah. I mean, you're talking about the Hibs game. It was superb. It was a thriller. It was a, a fantastic game of football at the end. Obviously, we came out in the right end of the result. I think, as you say, it wasn't the best of starts. I think we started off a wee bit slow. You talked about Doy Cheddar and then the goal. A couple of mistakes in there. I think Max. To be honest, I think the whole situation's avoided if he just comes and takes the cross instead of punching it. Jack was caught under the ball and then Mitchell's at the black post and he, he takes it well. But we we got ourselves back in the game. As much as we talk about mistakes for our goals, Matt Macy, who's about 19 foot tall, <laughs> I've never seen a goalkeeper that's that tall be so terrible at coming for a cross. Uh, <laughs> I've never, seen, I've never seen a goalkeeper who's about 10 foot tall still getting about 5 foot away from a cross <laughs> it was yeah he didn't cover himself in glory but it, it paid off for us big Ios managed to, to loop it into the far corner the second Hibs goal Maxi's positioning's a bit off I think he's far too tight to his front post in that situation I think if he's if he's kind of centre of his goals he takes that cross and it, we go in at half time half-time level, but I think, yes, we were amazing first half, but I also think, you know, we were well in the game. I thought we were competitive in it. We had chances. Nubli's had one where he's come off the left-hand side and he's whipped it around the far post, but second half, I think, a lot of credit has to go to Davy for the change that he made. Obviously, he kind of moved to a three at the back, brought Montano on as a wing-back, played Odin as on the right-hand side as a wing-back, and we absolutely bossed him for large spells of that second half. We absolutely bossed them. Classic of what we always say when you go and play hips, see if you're aggressive in the middle of the park and really get in about them and upset them, you'll get joy out of it. And we got the equaliser, a long throw. It's been a wee while since we've scored one from a long throw. Nubly involved in all three goals. He won the free kick for the for the first. He's then got the assist for, for Fitzy. Fitzy's managed to glance it into the net. And then... Uh, the second, uh, the third goal, sorry, it's brilliant play by Omionga, who, by the way, is going to win the Ballon d'Or this year. I've absolutely no, no doubt about it. And I'm going to call out Andy Semple here. Andy Semple said to me at Ibrox, Omionga does not get in the Hibs, Aberdeen or Hearts teams. I would like to put this to you, Andy, that Omionga walks into that Hibs team right, after that <laughs> performance at the weekend. I don't know what Hibs have done to Stefan Omionga, but I'm all for it because he is he was immense. But I'm going to give you your moment, Angus. Your man scored the winner. It was a absolute classic Alan Forrest goal off the left-hand side, whipping it in the far corner. I'm just going to give you a moment to just appreciate Alan. I mean, it's I'm not lie. It's been a it's been a rough week. You know, obviously the news came and breaking out that, you know the beloved Messiah would be leaving the club and um, potentially, I mean, I, I was looking as if, you know, he might be leaving, you know, even prior to this game. So 
as you say, you know, the ball winds up to him on that wing. And, you know, when he stands up a defender like that, there's really kind of one really option that's going to happen. I've seen it a couple of times in the first half, you know, not even just from Allen, but like from like Nubla as well, you know, squaring up, you know, the likes of Portuguese and stuff like that. They didn't look comfortable, you know, being isolated in those 1v1 situations. And yeah, as you know, with Forrest, it's kind of his trademark goal, essentially. And I just tremendous wee finish into the bottom corner past the, the 10 foot of Macy as well. But I what an absolute moment. And, you know, guy deserves it. You know, obviously he came on here and you were talking about the previous game where some people were maybe giving a wee bit of grief, you know, during the match saying that he can, can disappear or that he can go away to whatever team um, you know, for somebody like that, you know, to put in the performance, not only just get like the goal, but, you know, the performance showed exactly what Forrest is all about, you know, the quality that he has, but, you know, also the kind of player that he is, that he's not just going to, you know, down tools. You always see that phrase used at these kind of th- uh, times of the season where, you know, certain people's contracts are coming to an end, you know. Um, so absolutely delighted, you know, to see that and yeah, absolute cracking goal as well. But yeah, just about the Hibs game as a, as a total. I mean, looking at the, t- at the team lineup for, for Hibs and just messaging you guys instantly and being like, oh, I really fancy us against that midfield. During like the last couple of weeks there, I, I was at the Hibs Cove Rangers match, you know, cover the game. And that midfield was, I believe, Newell, the boy Campbell and Ewan Henderson. And even Cove Rangers were giving them a torrid time. And that's not like disrespect to like Cove Rangers. They've decent team likes so like Fraser 5 and stuff like that in their team again as you say Hibs don't like that kind of physical battle and Campbell and Henderson in that game for me were you know two of the worst players for Hibs and to then see them playing as a two without Newell who I'd say is probably Hibs's best centre midfielder that filled me with a great load of confidence because you know exactly what Omiyong is going to give us and you know what Holt's going to give us and then you know it was always kind of like would Pittman be playing as well Seeing that free up against that free, it was like, you know, we could really, really take that to them. And I think that showed essentially in, you know, particularly that second half. The third goal sums it up best, you know, those kind of players are looking to take like five, six touches on it, get their heads up and, you know, pass the ball. They're not going to have that time when like Omiyonga's chasing them down. And yeah, absolutely brilliant. And it does feel weird. And this is why, you know, like, it is strange that every time we do talk about Hibs and previews or anything like that, we always mention the exact same things. But it does happen quite a lot for us in our favour and, you know, that's why they have that moniker. Everybody does talk about it for a reason and it is quite interesting to see what's going to happen with Sean Maloney now because watching them in the last couple of weeks, they haven't been, you know, impressive at all. Obviously, they've lost Martin Boyle as well. Without them spending, you know, a lot of money, I don't really see it improving that much anytime soon. They're really lacking something that, you know, I think they're always kind of weak at the back at times if you put enough pressure on them or if you've got, you know, the likes of a new player or that who can, you know, really drag them all over the place. I don't think the midfield's nearly good enough. And then up front, they've just got nothing. Like Kevin Nisbet's having to drop 30 yards to, you know, start attacks. You want him in to be in the box. But yeah, you got any thoughts on Hibs as a whole going forward, Ewan? I mean, it's quite obvious, I think, that Maloney's trying to implement a style. He wants Hibs to play out from the back. But again, this is where I would give the credit to Davey in this sense. I think second half he got us to maybe push an extra 10, 15 yards up the park and really press Hibs. Hibs were trying to play from Macy, you know, from goal kicks, playing the ball inside their six-yard box to Bashiri and Porteous and play out. They were just inviting the press all the time. And they were struggling to bypass the press as well because they were adamant they were going to play out. And that's where the... That's where the third goal comes from. It comes from just pressing them in those areas. I know Amyonga wins it on the halfway line, but you press them to the point where they, you know, they're not comfortable in possession when they get it. And to me, that's credit to Davy for for noticing that. I think you touched on a few of our individual performers. I think that was the other thing. You know, talking to guys after the game, there were so many genuinely top top performances across the team. You know, I thought Fitzy had a a fantastic game, obviously got his goal as well. I was really impressed with Omionga. I've already, you know, touted him for the Ballon d'Or. Nubly, you know, I think he really grew into the game second half. I think he bullied Portis and Bashiri at centre half and Alan Forrest as well. I thought the entire game, I thought Alan was just a constant threat in the game. And I thought Odin Bailey as well grew into the game second half. He was fantastic in terms of carrying the ball for us and 
he's been, I have to say, he's been a fantastic addition. His defensive work as well was yeah. a lot of like a real shock. You know, obviously we can talk about you know this like like the forward players and what's expected of them. The amount of times you know the tracking and all that he did for somebody who is essentially quite a feel a flair player. Yeah, delighted for him as well. Yeah, it's, as I say, because he came in with a lot of pressure because he was essentially replacing Josh Mullen, who we all know is a massive fan's favourite. We love him on the podcast as well. And he's, you know, after four or five games to really get going, I think he's it proved to be a terrific addition. And as you say, that side of his game as well in, in recent times has really improved as well. So, no, I, th- I think every Levy fan will be absolutely delighted with the performance at Easter Road. It's a huge win. And it sets us up perfectly for what is a big double header coming up, which uh, we'll get onto later on on the podcast. Our women's side made the long awaited return to action last weekend against Rossville. This weekend, they returned home as they took on one throws in the Scottish Cup. It would prove to be a penalty heartbreak as the game finished one all after 120 minutes. Angus, you took this one in. You were covering it for the for the West Lothian Courier as well. It's a tough one to take for the ladies, wasn't it? Yeah, very much so. You know, they'd put in an awful lot of effort into this game and, you know, penalty is always a, you know, a lottery. Uh, so to lose it in that way is always very, very sad. The Weller fought it as well. I don't think it was the most enjoyable game for for us to one to be watching and then two for also the players to be involved in. The conditions were absolutely shocking, you know. It was all absolutely Baltic to begin with, but then, you know, the combination of the rain and the wind, it was just very, very awful, you know, for both teams <laughs> as well. And it just started to have a, you know, a bit of an impact on the game as well, you know, try to like get up the pitch and that from like goal kicks and that and the ball's just going straight out for throw-ins and that because the wind is just not allowing it to travel at all. But yeah, going into the game, you know, I was actually quite impressed with Montrose to begin with. Usually you, we're used to, you know, the Livingston team, you know, being quite high pressing in that. I think Montrose came and er- very early on tried to implement that onto the uh, onto the match. And I think in the first kind of opening stages that they had the best chances, like there was one that the Lassie Ridgeway went through on goal and there's a wee dink that she's done and it's literally just missed the post. So like the warning signs were kind of there that, you know, when Trolls were going to come and attack, you I mean, they were coming into this game, you know, as top of the Championship yeah. North. I think they've got some absolutely ridiculous goal difference stat. I can't mind exactly what it is, but I'm sure it's, don't think it's too far off of like plus like 70 or something like that. They're being, you know, on fire as like a attacking side. And yeah, you can see some of like, the qualities that they had. They looked like quite a young team as well, which was, you know, they looked to get the ball down and, you know, play kind of football the right way, some like good passing and stuff like that. But yeah, the last is kind of stuck in, you know, not an awful lot of chances, you know, throughout most of the first half for ourselves. But, you know, one did end up falling to Jen Dodds, you know, a scoop through ball comes there, takes a couple of touches and then on the half volley, absolutely smashed at home and... Jen's got that ability, you know, that if you give her that much time in that space in front of goal, that she's going to take advantage of it most of the time. Um, and yeah, it was an absolutely incredible finish, you know, to give us a 1 0 lead. Um, I think we also had another couple of chances later on in the first half that, you know, we probably could have, you know, ended up being 2 or 3 0 up. Um, I think another volley ended up at Jen Dodge's feet. Um, and I think she's just kind of connected with it at the wrong part of her foot, essentially, it's just went narrowly wide. I think there was an open goal as well for Rebecca Giaconelli, and I think, again, like the conditions have kind of played it, the ball's bounced to her, and she's tried to like, hit it into the into the net, and it's just, you know, been taken away from her at the last second, you know, by the wind, and it's ended up going just wide. Going into the second half, you know, I think maybe looking back at the game, they maybe went a wee bit too defensive too quickly. Five yeah. minutes into, you know, the second half, they took off Ashley Fish up front and brought on Fiona Boslam um, to go into the defence. I think Ali Strike pushed up a little bit, but it was, you know, it was more like they started the game as like a 4 one 2 one 2 I think it kind of went back to, you know, the, the classic kind of five at the back that we've seen from them in uh, most of this season. And, you know, trying to hold out against a team, you know, for 40 minutes is quite a tough task. I don't know if, you know, obviously we mentioned there about how this team has been free scoring and that in their in their own league, that maybe that was a concern. But yeah. I think that one of the main issues was that 
Jane Dodds became very isolated up top. You know, the ball was going up front and nobody else was really getting there to, you know, to support her. So the ball just kept coming back in. In saying that, though, I don't think that Montrose were essentially peppering the goal either. I think that Natasha Fru and Jess Murphy had absolutely tremendous games at the back. You know, we did everything perfectly well and stuffing out most dangers before he came into the box. Getting to the last couple of minutes of the game as well, it looked as if Montrose were going to equalise right before they ended up doing so. Um, some great play by them down the line. I think they rounded the keeper um, and then almost went to hit into the empty net. But Jason Murphy made an absolute tremendous block to you know to deny them at the time. Unfortunately, Montrose would then end up scoring from the resulting corner of that. So it was you know a very bitter uh, pill to take. But that's always the kind of risk that you're running in that kind of way that whenever you're trying to like hold on to that, then they're always going to have a chance. And if you keep on inviting that pressure and don't get out yourselves, then the inevitable will, will usually happen. I mean, it's kind of like what happened with us again. At Ibrox, essentially, you know, they are going to keep on getting those chances. It's going to fall to somebody. And uh, unfortunately, that's the way it happened. Going into extra time, you know, I was absolutely, to be honest, I was absolutely raging that we had the extra time. I was <laughs> I'm not, so cold. I'm not surprised, mate. Um, oh, you know, I was, I, mean, I obviously couldn't make, make the game, but I assume that fair play to the girls, I have to say that, you know, 120 minutes plus penalties in those conditions, the fact that they managed to put on a game of football and a bit of a spectacle is, is credit to them, I have to say. Yeah, honestly, when I seen it, I was next to Shrey, I was like, oh, for God's sake, here we go. Like, not a half an hour of this. And that's not because like the football was bad or anything. It was just essentially because I was frozen stiff. Needed to be defrosted like straight after it. But uh, yeah, second the, the, the extra times, there wasn't really either side, you know, properly taking advantage of it. No really major opportunities that either team could probably say that they deserve to nick it. Um, and then obviously it goes to, you know, the dreaded penalty shootout. Fair play to, you know, the Montrose. They fired away every penalty, um, comfortably so. And unfortunate for us, uh, Vicky was the one who, you know, went down the middle and the keeper's not reacted essentially to, like, she's not guessed either way and has stayed there and, you know, has made the, the vital save in the end. But a very spirited performance from us um, in the end. You know, there's a lot of kind of positives I would take, you know, despite the kind of heartbreak. I mean, as I said, Jess Murphy and Tasha Frew, as well as the other defenders as well, were very, very solid at the back. And, you know, if Montrose, you know, are one of the teams that's going to go up to, you know, the next league next season, I don't think that they're any much better than Livingston. Um, so they can clearly see, you know, the kind of standard that they're at. And, you know, maybe a couple of tweaks of things and, you know, they'll be reaching that kind of next level. But um, I'm sure they'll be hurting right now, but they've got a great opportunity, you know, get back on track. And based on the performance, I don't think they should be too discouraged by, you know, what they've done at the game. But, they just got to move on from it, essentially. Yeah, I think, you know, we talked about it last week on the podcast. I guess they've had four or five postponements prior to that, being back in action last week against Rossville, who are, you know, competing for a promotion in, in our league as well. And I think going and playing a cup tie, 120 minutes, the conditions that they were playing in against, as, as you pointed out, a very dangerous team who are high in confidence, top of the league, free scoring as well. So I think credit has to be given to the girls that, they did stick in for the 120 minutes and take it the take it the full distance, but hopefully they can they can bounce back in their next game, which Angus, I'm absolutely certain you'll have the details for you're the man in the know. Yeah, absolutely. This weekend, you know, they'll be playing Air United, who, you know, so Livingston currently sit six in the league, Air United are fifth, so a very big massive game there, um, you know, to get things back on track. So again, hopefully, you know, the weather will be better this time and some people may be encouraged to come. But yeah, the lassies are very deserving of the support and they'll be very appreciative of it as well. But yeah, hopefully, you know, we can get back to winning ways, you know, with a good performance against Air, who are a good team. Um, I think they, I think, don't think they had the best of starts to the season, but, you know, I think they've came into it a wee bit more recently. Um, but yeah, should be a cracking game and hopefully one that, you know, will come out on top of this time. The Lions face another double header this week. First up is a huge game against St Johnson at home. Ewan, how do you see this one going? As you said, it's a it's a massive game. I think you know we probably weren't expected to go to Easter Road and win. So 
that's a big three points and it's it's opened up a little cushion between ourselves and St Johnston. I know their their game was off at the weekend there, and that might help them a little bit, a little bit of break from the the last result, which was the nil nil against Dundee after the the cup exit against Kelty. But look, it's I always say this, you know, on paper, yes, we're in good form and. St. John's and I bought in the league. I don't think they've won in 11 games. There always comes a point where that those sort of runs have to end at some point. And that's where it always gives me a little bit of fear when it comes to us playing them. There's always a time where that run can come to an end. And I'm hoping it's not against us. But look, it'll, it'll be a tough game, I think. You know, St. John's then, I was speaking to Paul Ross Gardner, who's been on the podcast a, a handful of times talking about St. John's then, and the best way I can describe their, their season is it's like a band that has that incredible debut album that's all they'll never be able to replicate again. And then they're having that really dodgy second album, which you know they've tried to do something a wee bit different and it's just not working. And I think that's that's the way it's kind of panned out for Callum Davidson this season is he wins a cup double in his deb- debut season as a manager, qualifies for Europe. You're never ever going to match that at a club like St Johnston and it has just been a difficult season I think their season really took a, a downturn in results after we beat them up at McDermott Park in I think October time and they've really just slid down the table I think their start to the season was actually okay but they've really slid down the table and you know looking at looking at the stats their defensive record isn't that bad but they they just aren't scoring any goals at all and I think they've obviously been in the market this uh, this month in January, but again, I, I'll use Dundee as an example a few seasons back when they got relegated. They went and signed a load of players in January and you're hoping that these guys hit the ground running and, and make the difference. It's it's a big ask to go and sign five, six players and want them to settle straight into your team. I know they signed Nadia Chifchi, who you know has been a bit of a journeyman since he's since he signed for Celtic um, from Dundee United, where he had a very successful spell, and he's already out injured. I think he'll be a doubt for for midweek. He, I think it was a hamstring injury he had. So they've not really answered that problem at the top end of the park. I would say. I know they've been interested in Alan Forrest, but I believe Alan turned them down, as as we mentioned earlier on the podcast. So that's another option that they were looking for, as as not paid off for them. So yeah, I think. It's a massive game for us because, dare, dare I say it, I think if we were to beat St Johnston, I think we are really starting to look and push above and, and maybe look at trying to hit the top six. Uh, it just shows you the turnaround in our season from the start of the campaign where we were doom and gloom and we were well ready for the for the relegation scrap in the long haul. But I think if we, if we can get three points against St Johnston, we really need to start maybe reassessing our season and and trying to target the teams above us rather than looking behind us. Yeah, it's that kind of thing with St Johnston where I do believe last season something that was kind of similar. I think that they were bottom of the league for quite a large portion of the season and then certainly around January time that something started to click for them and you know they went on like a tremendous run. So there is always that fear you don't want to be that team who ends up, you know, getting like the hiding that, you know, somebody's been due off them. But I think maybe the issue is that St Johnson, you know, haven't just been playing well as a team regardless of that. I don't think many of the fans looking at their reactions are necessarily saying like, oh, we were unlucky there or it does seem to be as if, well, we've been beat and we've deservedly been beat, essentially. But yeah, for us, huge, huge game. We've got to be looking at this as a great chance to get three points. And, you know, we have been looking, you know, at the teams kind of above us with Ross County and St Mirren picking up recent points and big games as well recently, um, the win against on against Hibs on Saturday was even bigger. We've really got to be looking to take full advantage of this playing bottom of the league at home. Hopefully, you know, we can yeah um, deliver. And yeah, it is funny how football works. A couple of, I'm like a month's different essentially. And, you know, we're looking at potentially, you know, trying to catch up teams because, you know, we've looked at Hibs. We've already beat them twice this season. There's no reason why we can't catch the likes of them likes of Aberdeen and that haven't had great seasons either. So it's all about keeping ourselves right and, you know, hopefully we'll keep on doing the business on the park. But so I, I think um, obviously the team's been playing very well for the last couple of weeks, you and 
is there any kind of changes that you would like to see made from the Hibs game? Obviously, again, a different opponent or that. Um, I think the main one that will be giving Davy a massive headache is, you know, who does he play in that forward line? You know, usually if we play with three forwards, who does it make, who makes the cut into that situation there? You know, obviously you've seen Nubley coming in, being involved in all three goals. Bruce Anderson's been on tremendous form as well recently. Who, who makes the cut for you? I mean, it's a superb headache to have, isn't it? You know, we yeah. were talking at the start of the season and only a matter of a few weeks back, we were talking about Anderson Shinney as the debate up top, but Nubley's come in and he's he certainly made an impact on, on Saturday at Easter Road. I think you've also got the new arrival, Sebastian Soto, who, you know, I think he arrived, he had COVID. Let's a little bit of chat about him because tell you what, on paper, very, very exciting signing. He's a guy who's played for the USA at, at you know senior level, you know very good CV. He's played Bundesliga football. He's played over in Portugal. He's played you know with Norwich as well. I think if he can hit the ground running, I think he might take a a few games. But he could be a fantastic addition for the for the remainder of the season. But to kind of touch on Anderson Nubley, I'd I'd be more inclined to play Anderson for this game. You know you look at how the problems he caused Dundee running in behind, and he caused. St Johnston no end of problems in the game back at McDermott as well in terms of his press from the front and running in behind him. He had an assist and his goal that day and the first one came about from him running in behind down the channels. So I'd maybe be more inclined to play Anderson because he does, I think, will get chances in the game. And I think if you're wanting anyone in and around the box, it will be Bruce. He does have that kind of bit of a poacher instinct and I'd be more inclined to play him there, I think the other ones at left back, Jacko took a really dull one, I believe. Good few stitches above his above his eye from the challenge he had with Ryan Porteous at the weekend. So I think Penners is back available. I don't think the the knock that he took against against Dundee was as bad as maybe first thought. So Penners should be available for that as well. So but the team's playing well. The team is playing well. So sometimes, yes, we've got a lot of games. But sometimes you almost want to keep the consistency with your team when you're playing as well as that. So I can see him maybe freshening up a couple in the front three. You know, I don't see the midfield three changing. You know, they're all the three of them, Holt, Omionga, Pittman, they're essentially all Duracell bunnies. They can they can run up, they're probably running right now. Uh, whilst we're recording, I, I I just assume they'll be doing some sort of marathon. Um, the three of them just don't stop. So you know, I have no concerns about the three of them coming in and playing another 90 minutes on Tuesday night. But what's what's your thoughts on that? You mentioned that yourself. What's your thoughts on that kind of front three? Do you maybe see a couple of changes in there? I'm really not quite sure. I guess it's just kind of managing the workload of the team. And I guess, you know, the kind of like sports science and that may end up like kind of taking over in that kind of way, you know, all, all like the kind of stuff that they do about like testing that, about like how much people have played and all of that. Obviously, looking towards the Aberdeen game as well, are they going to keep certain players, you know, fit for that instead? Would the likes of, you know, Joel Nubley be maybe rested with eyes for, you know, an Aberdeen game, you know, to be a wee bit more physical against, you know, their kind of like centre halves or whatever? Possibly so. But right now, I think that, as you mentioned as well, the tremendous headache to have. We could go into this game against St Johnston and if we have a forward three of anything with Shinny Anderson Nubley, Forrest Bailey, the boy Soto. I mean, that's six options just off the top of my head. I think we'd all be fine with any combination of that six, which, you know, for a team like us, is never we've never really had we've never really had that kind of amount of options in this league to, you know, be like, wow, like and to think that we'd be so effective either way. Even throw Montano in there and as as well, to be honest with you. So I'm I'm really excited for the game and I think that's the main kind of thing that we're taking away from it. You know, it's very, very good, you know, to be back in really, really anticipating matches coming up like this. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can make all the difference in the game. Hopefully, you know, another IO goal would be great as well, you know, keep up his form, you know. But yeah, excited to see it and hopefully, you know, the three points stay here. Let's get a prediction then. So what are you what are you expecting for what is a massive game on Tuesday night? I could see it maybe going quite similar to the Dundee game. Uh, so I'm going to go for a 2-0 uh, home win for us. I'm going to go for 1-0, Livy. I think I think St Johnston will come and try and frustrate and be very difficult to beat. But I think we will have the quality in the end to, 
to get the result. So I'm going to go for 1-0 Livy and here's hoping we can get that result and really start looking at the, the teams above us in the league. I'm delighted to welcome on Glenn Schroeder from the Red Tinted Glasses podcast. Glenn, how are you doing? Yeah, hey, Ewan, well, I'm well, thank you. Thank you for the invite on to Talk Livy. It's about time. I've been on your one, two or three times, so it was good to repay the favour. Uh, you can come on ours this time and talk all Aberdeen. But safe to say, new era under Stephen Glass this season. It's been, best way to describe it, a bit up and down, a bit inconsistent. Uh, very much so, uh, especially away from home, uh, which obviously we're, we're previewing the trip to Livingston. Livingston was the one venue, or one of only two domestic venues that we've won at uh, this season. So hopefully that Max is feeling generous again <laughs> this weekend. <laughs> don't don't uh, remind me of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm very much looking for favours when it comes to away games this season. It's been two helping hands in in that sense, but... Obviously, we're recording this on Sunday evening. I'm a, I'm a bit unsure as to what our squad's going to look like by the yeah. time we travel to Livingston. Obviously, Ryan Hedges is confirmed leaving the club today. And, and Calvin Ramsey, by all accounts, looks set to do similar as well. I'm not sure on the inward, but losing those players potentially obviously on, on Ramsey is going to really affect our consistency, probably our most attacking player and, and certainly someone that's provided a threat um, albeit from right wing back. But look, we're trying to implement a decent style this season. We're trying to get a bit of creativity going forward. Unfortunately, uh, the results haven't been consistent enough. We picked up really well in December. Um, yeah. Obviously, uh, that was, the last, I think, the last time the two sides met uh, when Livingston made a gargantuan <laughs> trip to Aberdeen. Uh, Angus, that one's just for you especially. Um, and I'm, I'm I think on that day, though, and I listened to your review of that game, you guys didn't really turn up at all that day. I'm expecting a totally different uh, affair when we make the, the trip down down south. But look, I think from an Aberdeen point of view, what we're looking for now, you know, is obviously you guys are slowly creeping up on us in that race for the top six. But Aberdeen are looking for that bit of consistency between now and the end of the season as, you know, our hope will be top four and, and try and get that European spot. There's a few common links between the two sides. A couple of summer arrivals, ex Livy men and Declan Gallagher and, and Jet, J. Emmanuel Thomas. How have they settled in up north? <laughs> and do I have to speak about them? <laughs> um, do you know what I know? I, I feel bad now because I gave Jet a glowing reference when I came on at the start of the season as well because his form at the tail of the season has clearly not lived up to the expectations that I've set. <laughs> You know, you guys have, uh, and I wasn't sure, I said to you, I wasn't sure how Bruce was going to do. Uh, obviously, Bruce Anderson going the opposite direction, and you've definitely got the better end of the bargain <laughs> there. Declan's been unlucky, in my opinion, struggled with a couple of hamstring injuries. And then, obviously, coming in, he's looked a bit nervous at times in in, in the back three when he's played. Um, there have been rumours that he may or may not go out on loan to Dundee between... Uh, in the January transfer window. So again, this might be another another person, uh, the, the information is slightly false at time of release of the, the episode. But yeah, he's just been unlucky not getting game time with, with the injury. Jet, on the other hand, do you just want him back? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I said this when I was doing your one. When he came to us, he was obviously no match fit and it, it took him a while to get going. But Mm-hmm. You would have seen it in the games against yourselves last season. The guy does have ability yeah. about him. But I think for a football fan, he's incredibly frustrated because he's not going to go and make a long bust and run to go and press a fullback or you know go and put in a crunch and tackle. And he doesn't seem to like bully folk the way you'd expect a big guy like him to do. But the guy yeah. does have ability, and you need to just like come to terms with the fact that he's not going to do the things that football fans want him to do, type thing. Yeah, and I think that was the biggest frustration for us in our last game against St Mirren. He came on with us chasing the game at 1-0 and he was barely willing to chase the ball back and do the defensive side or or chase down uh, anything in particular. And it's 
obviously, you know, he, he promised 20 goals this season uh, when he when he signed. Uh, I don't even know how many he's, he's on. I can only remember his goal against Wraith, which again kind of goes back to what you said about that was that one moment of kind of real quality he's shown in, in this Aberdeen side. But yeah, um, your two former players have not really hit the heights that was probably expected of both. And Bruce Anderson came the other way. I know a few Aberdeen fans felt he was a bit unlucky to not be given the chance. What what was your take on Bruce up at Aberdeen? Yeah, I spoke to Bruce at Player of the Year a couple of years back, and I, I personally felt he was not being given the chance under Derek McInnes. And I think, you know, he kind of re- reciprocated that thoughts that, you know, he just wants to play football. He's he's in football to score goals. I know Martindale said similar after the Dundee game in his post-match comments. And, you know, I wasn't sure how he would do in the Premiership if it was his level. And I thought Livingston was an interesting move for him because I didn't think, with all due respect to to Livingston fans listening, uh, that your style of play would suit Bruce Anderson because Bruce, by all accounts, is a poacher, you know, tap-in merchant. And I didn't think that that would work for his style would, would suit Livingston's. But look, it has. And he's, you know, proved pivotal. I, I know he didn't obviously play um, against Hibbs. Um, Newblay played instead. So I'm, I'm intrigued in a, in a nervous way, looking ahead to the weekend's game, if those two are going to play up top together and, and how that works, or if it's going to still be the, you know, Newblay as the battering ram and then Bruce coming on to attack tired legs. Yeah, Newblay was, Newblay was unreal against Tabs, he, he absolutely mm. bullied uh, Portis and the boy Bashiri who, who came on. Uh, but I think the big turnaround with Anderson is, I when I initially saw him, I always saw a striker that plays off the shoulder and wants to run in behind. And we didn't really play in his hands, I thought. I thought we were trying to get him to link the game up and that's where he kind of fell out the side for Shinny coming in. But mm. the Dundee game was the prime example of when you can get the best out of him. We kept playing him in behind, down the channels, getting him running, stretching the, the Dundee defence. And he was he was borderline unplayable against Dundee. And I think he has come on leaps and bounds, even from the start of the season. You could always tell that the boy would score goals if you gave him chances. Mm-hmm. Like he's, as you say, he's got that poacher's instinct, which I don't think we've had for probably going back to since Ryan Hardy was there. So I would say it was the last kind of natural finisher that we had but Bruce has settled in settled in brilliantly at our place but kind of going back to Aberdeen it's we've mentioned the two games this season uh, <laughs> I'm sure you enjoyed the, the first one I yeah. still I think I have a mild form of PTSD from the first one with Max's <laughs> mistake and obviously the second game what what can we see from Aberdeen what do you expect Aberdeen to be doing when they come down to Levy? Um, yeah, as I said to you pre-recording, with all the, the Storm Malik and Storm Corey or Carrie, whatever it's called, coming in this weekend, <laughs> I'm still not sure if our game on Tuesday night is going to be going ahead in terms of fan safety. So we might have had a bit of a layoff between the defeat against St Mirren and coming into this game against Livingston. But regardless, I'm expecting a reaction because that performance against St Mirren was simply unacceptable regardless, new manager, old manager, whatever, the, the level of performance that the fans saw was simply unacceptable for an Aberdeen team. Um, I was wanting to see that reaction on Tuesday night, but then, you know, it's two, two tough venues to go to from Aberdeen. As mentioned already, our away form has not been at all perfect this season, if at all. And with, with yourselves just creeping up into the, the, the hunt for the top six, these are two big games for Aberdeen, especially that one on, on Saturday coming up because it's a real chance for Livingston to, to put their mark on trying to break the top six and obviously scupper our chances. I, I think Aberdeen will come and try and you know disrupt Livingston's style of play. I think the, the previous game, we almost gave you a bit too much respect. We let you dominate that first 45 and Stephen Glass changed things up at half time, and the, the game really swung with it. The Teddy Jenks goal, which I, again, Max could probably have done yeah. better with as well. Um, so if he's feeling generous this weekend, um, I'm all here for it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm really nervous for this game because we've we've looked poor. The Rangers games are kind of different, they kind of take care of themselves, but that St. Mirren game huffed and puffed for large periods, and now we, we don't have Ryan Hedges. So yeah, I think. With your with your impressive form 
uh, coming into this this game. It's maybe not a game that Aberdeen fans should be thinking as it's an easy three points as you know you normally do when you see these games written down on paper. You mentioned Ryan Hedges there just before recording his his move to Blackburn Rovers was confirmed. How big a miss is he going to be? And is there anyone that you think can kind of step up and and take his place? <laughs> um, if there's somebody out there that wants to be signed between now and Monday <laughs> night, then yeah, um, hopefully they can replace him. Obviously, we've signed Vicente Bezawin from Ado Den Haag. Uh, we've yet to see him play, uh, again, due to the St. Johnson game being called off because of the weather. So an unknown quantity in that aspect. We said on, on the podcast we expected him to be the replacement for Ryan Hedges. I suppose you're then looking to, to the likes of Connor McLennan as, as the next person to maybe step up in, into the roles of replacing Ryan Hedges. But there's just two, two unknowns. Uh, Connor McLennan in particular blows hot and cold. When he's on it, he's, I remember a game up at Pataudry, midweek game, our first season back up, and he played up against, I think it was Bobby Burns, at left back. Mm. Absolutely tore him a new one. And, yeah. you know, there's clearly a player there, isn't there? Yeah, there's too many times his head and his feet aren't in sync. Um, which is which is the biggest frustration and and right now with the removal of Ryan Hedges that's been the biggest asset to Christian Ramirez so again Christian's now got to go and get used to a new person give setting him up the chances so we might I'm, I'm hoping the game on Tuesday's on to give us that 90 minutes under the belt in preparation for Saturday otherwise uh, we could be going into this game a bit cold and with the way you guys are playing, uh, I fear we could get caught cold. And what's your prediction then, if I had to push you on one for the game? I know obviously there's a game midweek as well, so yeah. I normally hate doing predictions for these ones, but what what do you what do you expect to happen at the spaghetti hat? Well, the games between us don't tend to produce many goals, if at all. Uh, I'm going to say it's going to be a 1-1 draw. 1-1. I was going to go that as well because... We've not got a very good record against Aberdeen at, at Levy. No. Uh, we haven't. I think the last time we won was 2004. I think it was the season we won uh, the League Cup. That was the last time mm. we beat Aberdeen at, at Levy. So, yeah, you, you do, despite your moans about our pitch, you do have a good record on it in recent <laughs> times. <laughs> but what's, yeah. the, what's the expectation then for Aberdeen this season? Obviously, we mentioned at the start, it's been a big transition year with Stephen Glass mm. coming in. What's the, mm-hmm. what's the overall aim for Aberdeen this year? I think now um, we said it on Saturday after we saw the results coming in, uh, having not played, I think the expectation now is that we've got to go and get that fourth place. We've got a game in hand over Hibs and Motherwell above us. Um, They're within four points of of fourth. I know obviously yourselves and Dungeon United are kind of vying for that sixth spot, probably along with ourselves right now, if you want to, to say that. So it'd be fourth place, get European football back and just try and, get as far as we can in the Scottish Cup. But again, being drawn away from home and the way we've been playing away from home <laughs> was probably the worst draw for us, regardless who it was against. <laughs> oh, we've got an away tie. Our Scottish Cup record in general is honking, so I'm not expecting <laughs> us to go much further <laughs> based yeah. on uh, based on our history. But you you run the Red Tinted Glasses podcast, Glenn. Uh, you've yep. been doing that for a wee while. For any of our listeners that maybe haven't tuned into it before, give us a little flavour as to what you guys do. Yeah, so Red Tinted Glasses is available on YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you find and listen into your, your podcast. So we do it um, audio and visual just for being a bit different. What we like to do is preview matches and then do reviews. What we've been doing recently is doing uh, live reviews for all the midweek games. So um, if you want to hear our live reaction to, to Tuesday night's game against Ross County, I might be hungover, disclaimer for that one on, on Wednesday <laughs> lunchtime. Uh, fire over to our Twitter, RTG underscore podcast and, and our YouTube channel. You'll, you'll find our reaction there. We've also done a few former player interviews. So we've got ones coming up with Josh Walker and Lee Mayer. We've also done one with former Livingston player, Steve Tosh as well. Yeah. Talks very fondly about his time uh, at the club as well. So we've done a few former player interviews, but mainly it's just preview and reviewing the action following Aberdeen and, and giving our brutally honest opinions. Well, for any of, your, any of our listeners that haven't tuned in, I recommend you doing it because they are very honest. They're, they're quite refreshing sometimes. You do get <laughs> some, some of these podcasts that are overly biased, aren't they? But you guys are very, very honest when you come to your assessments, Aberdeen. But Glenn, uh, I hope 
your trip down to Livy is absolutely horrendous. Uh, I hope <laughs> you, you go home crying. I'm not going to lie. But uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's much appreciated. Yeah, no problem. I um, I actually won't be going home crying because I'm not, unfortunately, not going down. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's still, it's it's really frustrating. It's still the only ground. It's the only league ground I'm yet to tick off. But unfortunately, uh, parent duty means there's no trip to Livingston this weekend for me. So it'll be once again, I'll be complaining about the price of paper if you don't be worried about that. <laughs> oh God, you had to get it in, didn't you? you I had did. To get it in. <laughs> I haven't complained about the pitch, so I'll go with a pay-per-view. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> That's it for this week's episode of Talk Livy. Thanks again to every single one of you for tuning in week in, week out. If you can, we'd love to hear your feedback. Either leave us a review on iTunes or simply message us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. As you said, we're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. So search Talk Livy to find us. You'll find all the links to our weekly episodes on there as well. You can also find all our episodes, including this one and all good podcast streaming sites, including iTunes and Spotify. We're also on YouTube, so don't forget to subscribe to the channel. If none of those options suit you, all you have to do is head to our website, talklivypodcast.libson.com, where you'll find every single episode we have done over the last few years. That's it for this week. Thanks to all our listeners for tuning in, and let's hope for another great week following the Lothian's finest football team. Thanks, Don.